Christians talk a lot about grace, but many of us find it very hard to live with. You see, grace breaks all the rules. Most people, I suspect many Christians in good churches, hearing good ministry every week, readjust what they've just heard from the pulpit as they leave by the church door. And so, whatever they repeat from the sermon over Sunday lunch, they actually live with a sense of life that's a bit like karma. Karma says, do good, get rewarded, do bad, get punished. But what you get from Jesus is this incredible good news. That God loves us, not because of who we are, but because of who he is. And no matter what we have done, no matter what we are, forgiveness is there for the asking because of who he is. Now, now that might sound amazing, but it has a flip side, which can cause enormous offence. And that glorious offence of the gospel, the good news of Jesus, is something we need to look at today. Let me show you what I mean in Matthew 9, verses 9 to 13. In verses 9 to 10 of Matthew 9, what you've got there is Jesus calling outcasts to be disciples. Now, now Jesus has just demonstrated the extent of his spiritual and physical authority in Matthew 9, 1 to 8. Some men brought to him a paralysed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, This fellow is blaspheming. And knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, Get up, take your mat, and go home. And then the man got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe, and they praised God who had given such authority to man. So, so, so do you see the point here? Jesus, the one like a son of man from Daniel 7, has authority on earth to forgive sins. That's here in verse 6. So the sign that proves this to these teachers of the law is therefore before their very eyes. The man who could not work, walk previously gets up at Christ's mere verbal command, picks up his mat, rolls it up, walks home. Now that's the context of the passage we're now going to look at. The authority of Jesus, the Son of Man, to forgive sins as evidenced by this miraculous act of the Messiah, prophesied by Isaiah, making the lame man walk. And against this authoritative, sin-remitting background, Jesus, very immediately after all of that happening, Jesus approaches an outrageous man they all knew as Matthew. Matthew. Also called Levi. So he was from a priestly family. Now the quizzling tax collector for an invading enemy. Matthew. First of all, we're told about where Jesus found Matthew. Matthew, where Jesus found him. Verse 9. As Jesus went on from there, that is where he'd done this thing that demonstrates his authority to forgive sins. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Now, just in case anyone is thinking, hang on, it doesn't say Matthew was a tax collector, just that he was sitting at the tax collector's booth. He may just have dropped by for a mug of tea or something. Well, there's something important you need to realise here about first century tax collectors. Nobody drop by for a mug of tea with first century tax collectors in Israel. Nobody except other tax collectors, that is. Despised and rejected by the general population who they oppressed, they only had one another really to socialise with. And you see that coming up further on in verse 10, but let's, let's not jump the gun. Matthew was sitting, doing his job at the Telonion, the tax booth. The tax booth was a booth located at a port on the edge of a city or a town to collect taxes on trade. These taxes were a, a form of customs duty or toll applied to the movement of goods and produce brought into an area for sale. And as such, these tolls were sort of a sales tax paid by the seller, but obviously passed on to the purchaser in the form of increased prices. 
a system as a whole is sometimes referred to as tax farming because a contract to collect these taxes for an entire district would be sold to the highest bidder who'd pay up front hire employees to do the work of collection and then recoup the investment and overhead by charging commissions on top of the taxes. And although rates and commissions were regulated by law, there was in practice plenty of room for abuse in the system through the subjective valuation of goods by the tax collectors, even though, well, those valuations may not have been realistic and the tax would therefore be higher. Even, even there was outright bribery, we're told. So tax overseers and their employees were obviously not going to be very well liked. Now, we know there was a tax booth in Capernaum. It was on the trade route from Damascus to Galilee and onto the Mediterranean. And it was at this tax booth that Jesus met Matthew, also named Levi in, in Mark 2.14, Luke 5.27, although indirectly employed by the Romans, was probably more directly responsible to Herod Antipas, the Tetrarch of Galilee appointed by Rome. And it was Matthew's job to collect customs duties for Rome. He was thus despised by his fellow Jews, many of whom would have regarded him as a traitor, quite possibly an extortioner, overcharging, doing them out of their hard-earned money. Now, given that Jesus has recently also called to be his followers some fishermen trading their catch along the highways out of Capernaum, Andrew and Peter, James and John, humanly speaking, let's just say team meetings could be about to get a bit spicy amongst Jesus' disciples. So Jesus found Matthew, this sort of guy, at the tax booth, being the sort of person who was hated, despised and made an outcast by his very own people because of the work he did for Herod Antipas, also for the Roman invaders. Worse than that, we already noticed his other name there. He's called Matthew, but he's also called Levi, and that didn't indicate his family were in the blue jeans business. It indicated his lineage lay firmly in the priesthood. But as we know, his life wasn't being lived as a servant of his God, but as a collaborator working for the oppressors of his people. Other disciples, we've mentioned the fishermen, but I'm thinking also of Simon the Zealot, the feeling would have been pretty general anyway amongst the disciples. They would have seen Matthew as the lowest and the worst of their people for not just economic, but also nationalistic and political reasons. But look, Jesus sets the principle from these very early days of calling followers to himself that he is going to call all sorts of undeserving people into his kingdom. Matthew. Matthew, where Jesus called him from, Matthew, where Jesus called him to. Jesus called an unacceptable individual and called on that person to follow him. Now, now there are a couple of self, uh, there's a couple of things here that no self-respecting Jewish rabbi in, in the culture would have done. Firstly, Jesus went and spoke to a tax collector, deemed by them to be an unclean person. And secondly, Jesus called the man to be his disciple. Whereas with Jewish rabbis of the time, you had to persuade them to take you on as your disciple, and it didn't come cheap, right? But Jesus marched straight up to Matthew, who was currently engaged in the activity that made him such an unacceptable person in the view of the religious leaders and the devout people of his time. And Jesus was utterly specific about what he was calling Matthew to do. He didn't need to specify what he was calling Matthew from, because it was strongly and clearly implicit in what Jesus called Matthew to do. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. Akolutheo. To follow one who proceeds, to join him as his attendant, to accompany him, to join one as a disciple, to become or to be his disciple. Jesus is calling Matthew, as he generally calls on everyone, to live a life, leave a life of sin, and walk in his way. Now this is crucially important. We get into a whole world of grief if we don't straighten out our theology at this point here, and this is the major point we're going to grasp today. The biblical position is that we have all, like wandering sheep, gone astray. All. We've turned every one of us to his own way. Isaiah is unfalteringly explicit about this. You can read about it in Isaiah 53, 6. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. No exceptions. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Ah, now then, do you see? The decisive intervention is made not by us, 
but by the Saviour of our souls. The distinction in humanity is not about the good and the bad people, but it is about the Lord laying on him, and you know who him is, Jesus, the Lord laying on him the iniquity that belongs to us all. And that that's why there's hope for the outrageous person who turns to Christ, but none for the lovely little old lady sitting in the corner of the church who refuses him. Did you hear what I said? There's hope for the outrageous person who turns to Christ, a sinner turning to Christ, but none for the lovely little old lady who refuses him and doesn't turn to Christ. Now let's take a moment there because some will find this very hard to swallow, but it is the truth of God. There's uh, an American theologian, but he's a good guy, who uh, writes for the Gospel Coalition. He's, 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 a, he's a good guy, right? He says this, Could it be possible that Jeffrey Dahmer, one of the most evil men to ever live, he's, he's convicted of multiple murders and stuff, right? Uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, one of the most evil men to ever live, was granted eternal life? That is because he turned and trusted Christ. And could it be possible that a sweet old lady who never trusted Christ would face judgment? Now, Trevin Wax, what a wonderful name. He says this. If that scenario bothers you, you haven't truly grasped just how radical the gospel of grace is. You haven't grasped the gospel of grace. It means that deep down you still think good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell. But the gospel shatters that whole way of thinking. You see what he's saying? The world we live in tends to think good people are going to go to heaven. Or our people are going to go to heaven. That's the other development of all of that. The people we like. And other people, bad people, are going to go to hell. The gospel shatters that whole way of thinking. Scripturally speaking, says Trevin Wax, there are no good people. We all have sinned. We have turned away like sheep and gone astray. We all have raised a fist toward our maker to say, I want my life my way. Don't like to admit it, but that's true, isn't it? And the radical message of the gospel is that our problem, sin, is worse than anything we could ever imagine, but also that the solution, grace, is better than anything we could ever deserve. Through repentance and faith, says Trevin Wax, any sinner, no matter how great the offence, receives access to God through the cross of Jesus Christ. Just pause there a minute, if you would. Are you okay with that? Are you okay with the Lord doing and saying this sort of thing? Are you sure? Because the consequence of that looks like this, says Travin Wax. Hell is full of people who think they deserve heaven. Heaven is full of people who know they deserved hell. But of course the Saviour steps in for them, isn't he? What's happening in our story is that Jesus is calling Matthew the outrageous, which is basically as much as what Matthew the tax collector amounted to. Called him, that guy, to turn from what he'd been doing to following Christ's way. And that was the decisive intervention to which Matthew made the decisive and appropriate response. What was Matthew's response? Because whoever we are, this is the response to the gospel call of Christ. The call to be put right with God to be saved, to be sorted. Matthew's response was this. It says, And he got up, and he followed him. Kainastas ekolutheisen auto. There is a conjunction there indicating Matthew heard Jesus call him to the following of discipleship, and got up straight away and followed Jesus. Now, the description of what Matthew then goes on and does uses the exact same verb you get in Jesus' call to him. It reflects pretty much what rabbinical discipleship was all about. Yeah, yeah trainee rabbis learned from the teachers of the law that they were discipled to as those teachers discoursed daily, giving lectures, I suppose, on the finer details of the law. Sadly, that's as far as our Bible colleges go these days. But beyond that, these rabbinical disciples, they lived in the rabbi's home. And they were expected to trail the rabbi round from dawn till dusk, watching, prying into the details of the way they lived out the teaching of the Jewish law in their lives, following, observing and learning to live the law in the rabbi's way. 
And Matthew straight away got up, walked away from the tool, toll booth at the roadside, and he followed the Jesus who'd called him along the way. Now, that's an astonishing thing. But we're invited immediately to contrast that response of Matthew with the response of the teachers of the law to the authority and to the kingdom call of Jesus. Because what happens next, and this is verse 10, and that's how far we've got so far. In verse 10, we find Jesus calling outcasts his friends. What happens in, in verses 11 to 13 here of, of Matthew 9 is that Matthew's response to Jesus is immediate and dramatically contrasted with the Pharisees' responses. But, but where does that outrage and offended response the Pharisees made later come from? It comes directly from verse 10. Look at this. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. Now, his, first of all, let's just notice something else that's in contrast with anything any contemporary rabbi would have done. It's yet another thing that was going to cause the religious and the self-righteous types utter shock and outrage. Jesus invites himself to Matthew's house. <laughs> Jesus has got a bit of a track record for doing this. You may well remember one Zacchaeus, another tax collector, who Jesus called out of a tree and invited himself to Zacchaeus's house for tea. Do you remember the children's song? Said Zacchaeus, come on down, I'm coming to your house for tea. Well, here is in Matthew's case. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. Follow me, says Jesus. Where are we going? Your house, get the dinner on. That would be a scandalous thing to say in our culture anyway. But there, rabbis were besieged with invitations to dinner and only accepted the best ones, which it was the host's great privilege to have accepted. But here Jesus invites himself to dinner with someone who considers themselves way below having Jesus to dinner. And the rabbis would be scandalised by such behaviour. But there's more. At this point, just please notice, Jesus demonstrates his authority to forgive sin by doing one of the works of the Messiah prophesied in Isaiah 35, 6 about the lame man being made to leap for joy, right? We saw that in verses 1 to 8. He then straight away goes out to where he knows he'll find one of the biggest social and religious outcasts of his day, a Levite who's turned his back on his people and now to their great outrage plies a disreputable trade profiting from the exploitation of his own people by a foreign invader. He goes out to the tax booth where Matthew is. And against every custom and precept of the time, Jesus calls that man to follow Jesus and be saved. Outrage, outrage, outrage. Who do you want to see enter the salvation that he brings? Who do you deep down think he'll save or has saved? In fact, Trevin Wax isn't wrong about this matter. We do tacitly under the surface react and behave as if Jesus is for the nice people. The truth is he only saves sinners. Which is great news because there are in fact no naturally nice people out there. By nature, humanity is shot through with the tendency and the predisposition to sin. It just shows up in different ways in different people. Some look more respectable than others and some are so hidden you don't get to see very much. And yes, that is not what we want to hear. We'd in many ways rather be saved by grace ourselves than run with the Pharisees in our responses. Well, you can't have him, you can't have him. He's a fool. <laughs> see, the distorted view of respectability in those Pharisees is an addictive thing. But it's an addictive thing that many of us also long for. We, we all seem to be Pharisees there somewhere deep beneath the skin. Can you cope with a scandalously gracious God who calls sinners into fellowship with himself? Not just the sort of sinners that we like, but the ones that with a passion we would despise. Can you? Can you accept the people you despise as being called into the loving fellowship of Jesus? Can you accept the people that you think of as good and nice and lovely and kind, do lots of good things and speak nicely to everybody, talk Welsh to the elderly? You know how it is. You know how these cultural things matter to us. They're not the gospel things. The gospel distinction is clear. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but are put right with God again. 
reckoned righteous by his grace through the redemption that comes by Christ Jesus. Full stop. Check it out in Romans 3, 23 following. And that's exactly what was prophesied there in Isaiah in 53 verse 6. And it's exactly what we see in the practice of Jesus when he walks up to a, a tax collector's booth, a despised person, on that road out of Capernaum. And he says to that guy, Levi, a renegade priest, gone over to the enemy, exploiting his own people and grinding the faces of their hard-working business people. Follow me. Come and follow me. Where are we going? We're going to your house to get the dinner on. Okay. I paraphrased a bit. But you see the point? And the socially upright, the culturally moral, those who fit in to the mores of that time and that culture, those who are the beautiful people, but who do not turn from sin to follow Jesus, remain outside the kingdom of God, outraged by the scandal of God's grace. Where do we stand with that? There are two responses. There's the response of the Pharisees in the story. And there's the response of relief and joy at the acceptance of God for those who turn from sin and trust him. That you see in ex-renegades like Matthew quite possibly with his mates but there's there's one more thing there's one more feature of the scandal of such glorious grace which we'll come back to in the passage when we meet together here next time god bless you may he give you grace this week to rejoice in the glory and the wonder of his grace and to work that principle work that theology deep into every corner of your thinking and every corner of your being. Mm -hmm.